hello, and welcome to another episode of Two Guys and a Chainsaw. I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. And today, Craig and I decided to go with the 1960 version of Little Shop of Horrors. Now, I don't know, Craig, if... Well, I guess I'm just going to out you here. Craig has been... That's in a, cool. <laughs> Craig has been performing in a, the musical version of Little Shop of Horrors uh, this last week in our community theater. How's that been going, Craig? It went great. It's actually over now, um, but uh, it went really well. It was uh, a really fun group of people to work with, and uh, it was a show that I'd wanted to do for a really, really long time. So it was a really, really good experience. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> you you played Seymour, didn't you? I did. And- I did. And, you know, this uh, what the, the film that we watched for today um, is the 1960s version, uh, which I had never seen. You know, I've been watching the 1986 version, I believe, um, the one with Rick Moranis um, and Ellen Green. And I've been watching that since I was a little kid, and I've always loved that movie. Uh, and so, you know, this summer I had the opportunity to do the play version, which the – the Rick Moranis movie is actually based on. So I had never seen this 1960s version until today. Um, And it was kind of cool to uh, compare similarities and differences and just see the original source material. Yeah. What did you think? I don't, you know, I didn't really have much expectation going in. Um, I was surprised kind of, I guess, that I had never watched it just because I had been such a big fan of the musical and the the musical movie. Um, I knew very little about it. I remember when I was a kid seeing uh, the, the, you know, the VHS uh, at the video store, um, which always very prominently featured Jack Nicholson on the cover. Um, and, uh, I was always kind of confused by that. I don't think that, you know, when I was little, I really understood the concept of remakes and different versions of things. And, um, so, uh, watching it today, um, going in with very little expectation, um, I, I thought it was cute. I thought it was, was charming. And I was actually, uh, surprised by how close closely both the Broadway show and uh, the movie musical follow it. Um, clearly, obviously, there's difference uh, differences. Um, you know, this uh, original is not a musical. Um, but beyond that, uh, there are a lot of similarities, striking similarities, um, even some, you know, some of the lines clearly directly lifted from the source. And uh, so it was fun. It was fun to watch. Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, uh, this is a movie that I had seen a few times, and it was a little notorious for me. I think because because you saw it everywhere, because um, this is a Roger Corman film, and it was one that he shot pretty quickly. Um, I think actually all of the scenes that happen indoors in the interiors take place over two days. Um, th- it, I mean, he shot them over two days. <laughs> right. Because uh, he was very well known for um, getting the most out of his money, and he would shoot a film, and we've talked about this before, he would shoot a film, um, and then he would still have time left over on everybody's contract and still have these sets left over, and so he'd quickly have somebody whip up a screenplay, and he'd shoot another movie, and sometimes that second movie would do even better than the first. (laughs) This um, movie was, was shot on old sets from another film that he did called Buckets of Blood. Uh, and he was able to convince uh, whoever owned uh, the studio that he was uh, shooting in to let him use the sets for a little while longer, and they quickly whipped this thing together. And obviously, it turned out to have a lot more staying power than Buckets of Blood, although it didn't do quite as well at the time. I think he was so disappointed in the box office turnout for this little film that he didn't even bother to renew the copyright, and so it slipped into the public domain. And so you've been able to buy this like at dollar stores and on those cheap DVDs. Right. sets with a bunch of films. It's shown up on TV quite a few times, and all of the, the horror movie hosts like Elvira and those folks um, have done this movie just because it's been so available and, and free to use. Right, and because it's public domain, it's legally available on YouTube, and that's uh, how I watched it today. Um, yeah, from from what I understand, um, this almost was was the result of like a bet or a dare. Uh, Corman uh, talked to, I don't remember if it was a friend or his brother or something along those lines, and he bet that he could uh, shoot a movie, um, rehearse and shoot a movie uh, in a couple of days. And that's kind of um, where its notoriety came from initially, I guess. Um, from what I've read... 
in reality, he actually rehearsed the actors for a few days before shooting, but he did most of the principal shooting, like you said, in those two days. Uh, and then they, they did do some, uh, some reshoots in, in the subsequent weeks. But um, even, even that, you know, they shot this on a budget of $30,000 over just a couple of days. And I was really impressed because I thought as far as the filmmaking went, it was really competent. I mean, you would think, you know, something that was done so on the fly that that would be pretty obvious. But uh, I think that it stands up with any of those, you know, B movie monster movies um, from this era. Oh, I totally agree. And I think a lot of that probably has to do with the competence of the acting. I mean, most of the people in here are pretty seasoned actors, even if they're seasoned in low budget films. Um, They're clearly very, very competent, very good at what they do. Um, the star Seymour Krelborn is played by a guy named Jonathan Hayes, who you're not going to see in a lot of films, but he was in quite a few of Roger Corman's movies before this. So he was a uh, well seasoned in the Corman shop. Jack Nicholson. This was one of his first movie roles. I think it might've been. Yeah, I think it was his third. Mm-hmm. And then Dick Miller, uh, who we've talked about before, uh, is in this film right. too. And, uh, and he just keeps popping up and he was a mainstay of Corman's. In fact, he starred in Buckets of Blood, which was the movie that Corman shot right before this. Um, right. And I, and I read that Corman wanted him to play the role of Seymour, but he just didn't want to uh, for whatever reason. So he turned it down and ended up playing a smaller supporting role. Um, but all of the principles Principal actors here, uh, Jonathan Hayes, who you said played Seymour, um, Jackie Joseph, who played Audrey, and Mel Wells, who played Mushnick, the three central characters. I think all of them had worked with Corman fairly extensively. Um, and uh, so, you know, that may have, <laughs> and that kind of struck a chord with me too, because, you know, like, I just did this with our community theater who is, you know, we're, I'm in a small community. And so we, I work with these same people over and over again. So it was kind of cool to see another group of people who were familiar with one another, who had worked with one another before um, and seeing how, you know, they could put something together that uh, was really pretty fun and, and kind of has stood the test of time. Probably, uh, for you know the reasons that you already said because you know it's public domain so it got a lot of exposure and then also because um the the musical and the movie of the musical went on to uh, be successful and have a large cult following and I'm, I'm sure that has something to do with why this has kind of um stayed in the mainstream somewhat uh but yeah cool well, yeah, and you know, the, the movie itself really lends itself well to a play. In fact, I was watching this with my wife, and she, after a little while, asked me, she said, did this used to be a play? And I said, no, but it's clearly filmed like a play. It's clearly written like a play would be. You know, it's limited right. mostly to those couple interiors of Mushnick's flower shop uh, and later on the dentist shop for a couple scenes. But the whole thing is staged. In fact, even the writing and the jokes – and kind of the way it, it moves and flows is very reminiscent of a play. And I, I think a lot of that, too, uh, you know, the way that they filmed it, um, they were filming it very quickly. A lot of it was done only in one take. And uh, Roger Corman, even in order to save time, used multiple cameras, which is pretty unusual for a movie. So they had the one set up. The whole set was lit so they could move anybody any, anywhere they needed to without having to relight you know, things for different shots. And then they were covering everything with a couple different cameras at once. So uh, boom, you, know, you do a whole section and boom, you're done. And, and you can tell in the movie that a lot of this is is really one take i mean if you're paying attention there's the continuity sure. between shots it's obvious that this is just the same um take from a different angle which is really unusual for a movie but again when you watch this you can't help but think man this would make a really good play and clearly that, yeah. <laughs> that's what those guys had in mind when they turned it into a musical right right and it's fun. You know, it's, it's a goofy, we, you know, we do all kinds of, of movies. We talk about all kinds of movies. And, and I think that both of us, you know, like, you know, diversity and horror. Um, this one, you know, it's, it's, again, it's filmed in 1960. And so of course it's a, a, you know, really light on any kind of violence or gore. There's, there's very little, if any at all. Um, and it's it's not scary, you know. What they what they did is they basically took a horror premise and kind of filmed it as a comedy. Um, and it's 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 much funnier than it is scary at all. Um, and and 
and that's fine. You know, I, I knew that going in and that wasn't a, a concern for me, but, um, the premise is, is simple and cute. And like they had thrown around several different ideas, uh, I guess, in prepping, you know, they just decided we're going to make a movie. Let's, you know, let's brainstorm some ideas. And, um, initially they had thought about, um, kind of a, a crazy chef, uh, who, uh, you know, killed people and cut them up and served them in his food. And, you know, they kind of passed on that idea. At one point, it was going to be kind of a play on a Dracula kind of thing. Um, and eventually, after a night of uh, drinking and brainstorming, um, uh, one of the writers the, uh, uh, said, well, what if we do a, a killer plant, a man-eating plant? Um, and from what I've read, Corman, who had had several drinks at that point, said, that's it. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. And they just rolled from there. Yeah. And 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 again as you said it's really cute and it's it's original i mean it's really pretty original for its time i don't know if anybody had ever really done this i mean there are there were like eating man eating plant films um i'm not sure how soon before or after this usually they were aliens you know that came in from somewhere right. else and had kind of a plant form but in this uh, you just have this flower shop and it's run by this guy named Mr. Mushnick, who, of course, is upset because his flower shop is in Skid Row, which is the bad part of town. And he doesn't get any business. And he's thinking about closing it up. And he's mad at all of his, his – basically, his two employees, who are Audrey, who's this just ditzy girl, and uh, Seymour, uh -huh. who's this klutzy guy. And boy, do they play up his klutziness in this movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the in the very beginning of the movie, you know, it opens – well, actually, no, it, it opened – and this was one of the differences. You know, it, it starts with this kind of interesting – you know, the credit sequence is over this illustrated um, version of Skid Row. Um, and then it sounds almost like Dragnet. You get, yeah. like, the detective voiceover. My name is Sergeant Joe Fink, working the 24-hour shift out of Homicide. And this is my workshop, the part of town that everybody knows about but that nobody wants to see. Where the tragedies are deeper, the ecstasy's wilder, and the crime rate consistently higher than anywhere else. Skid Row. The most terrifying period in the history of my beat began in a little run-down floor shop called Mushniks. And of course, that's an element that they left out of uh, the the play and and the movie musical, uh, and and I think rightly so you know it, it really seems kind of forced and and unnecessary um but yeah then we get right into the the flower shop where we meet the principal characters and um seymour's first entrance you know you hear him singing in the back and and mushnick kind of um uh yells at him or whatever but when he comes out you know it's a total pratfall um uh, right into the scene. Uh, and again, you know, that's something that uh, the play, you know, picked right up. You know, I'm bruised from head to toe from that pratfall every night. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's it's cute. And, you know, it's, it's cutesy from then on. Lots of little jokes. Um, I, I think that, you know, there's uh, quite a few um, jokes uh, about Jewish culture that I don't even really think that I necessarily got. Uh, in fact, um, they had some problems with distribution because uh, distributors were afraid that people would view it as being anti-Semitic. Um, I didn't see that at all. Uh, and Corman said, you know, that was not his intention at all. You know, these were just Jewish characters and, um, you know, they played into the comedy. Um, but yeah, so it's the, it's the little flower shop. It's failing. Um, Seymour, uh, is a klutz. He's, you know, he can't do anything right. He's messing up flower orders. He's breaking stuff. And so Mushnick fires him. He says, you're fired. Um, and uh, Audrey says, well, hold on a second. Seymour's been working on this new plant. Um, you ought to take a look at it. And so Seymour comes out with this little what looks like, you know, a little kind of, uh, Venus flytrap, uh, looking thing. Um, and it's cheap looking, you know, <laughs> like it, it's obviously, it's obviously, you know, just a cheap prop. It doesn't really look like plant life at all. Um, but it's just this cute little thing and, and they start talking about it and it, and, uh, uh, it moves, it moves on from there. Yeah, you know, the, the dialogue is so funny and snappy, and that's something that I had forgotten about when I was a kid. I think because a lot of these jokes just went right over my head. I, as a kid, I really wanted this to be a horror film, and uh, I wasn't looking for the comedy, and I didn't find it. But man, as an adult, this, this comes at you it's in spades, and that's again why it feels so much like a play. It's just really uh -huh. funny, snappy dialogue, and I've got to give credit uh, to the writer here. 
Charles Griffith, who, um, you know, this wasn't his first rodeo. He actually wrote most of Cor- um, most of what he wrote were Corman films. A lot of them, some of Corman's most um, most uh, notorious ones. And I, I love the part where Seymour, it, like Bushnick's talking to Mrs. Shiva, who keeps coming in, and and that's another Jewish joke. Uh, this woman keeps coming uh-huh. in, uh, getting buying flowers for these dead. Oh, so and so died, and so I've got to get flowers. And oh, now so it's like her, his only customer is this woman who just needs flowers for a funeral that's happening every other day. And uh, yeah, and I and I apologize if we have Jewish listeners because I know so little about the Jewish culture. But from what I understand, even the name Shiva Shiva is kind of I think um, a uh, Hebrew death ceremony, kind of maybe the equivalent of a wake or something. And yeah, every time she comes in, it's somebody new in her family has died, um, and it's just a running gag. And there are lots of running running gags like that and they, they they play well they play funny oh dick miller's character who loves to eat fl- he gets the flowers just so he can eat them which is insane <laughs> it yeah he, go- he goes from being this guy who is going to be the star to this inc- <laughs> this weird bit part but it's so cute i, I don't know it's just kind of funny it is cute. every now and then he pops in and he's kind of the guy in the scene who makes little comments and he's the one who actually comments he says you know mr mushnick if he's got this weird plant um, this plant could become really popular and really save your shop, and and so uh, he he does have an a, an important role to play. But otherwise, he's just like whipping out a salt shaker every now and then, um, sprinkling it on some carnations and just munching down on them. <laughs> right, and you know we have like you said we've talked about Dick Miller and his Roger Corman connection a bunch of times. Um, which uh, which version of this did you watch? Did you watch the original black and white or the colorized? I watched the black and white version. Okay, I was going to. I had every intention of watching the black and white, but the transfer that I was watching was really blurry. Um, and so after the first five minutes, uh, I, I switched over to, you know, again, just on YouTube, I switched over to the colorized version. And it had been so blurry that I hadn't even realized that that was Dick Miller. Oh, no. And when he... And when he popped up on stage, or, or not on stage, I guess, on screen um, in color, like... A, a, a huge smile just came across my face. Like this guy is so charming and cute and charismatic and you've seen him in so many things and he's just got this, you know, funny air about him. And here he is eating these flowers and uh, just so silly. And, and he really, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a big uh, bonus uh, in this movie. And I didn't know this until after, you know, again, like I said, we've talked about him a bunch of times. And the thing that I always remember him from um, is uh, Gremlins um, and, and Gremlins 2. And uh, after the movie, when I was, you know, looking at some research and whatnot, um, I saw that Jackie Joseph, who played Audrey, actually played opposite him played his wife in both the gremlins movies and again it was just a connection that made me smile and um you know really brought back memories from my childhood and that was a lot of fun too well you know this movie is just filled with a lot of hilarious almost goofball jokes um seymour then goes home and we are introduced to his mother who's this invalid who is uh, kind of a hypochondriac obviously feigning sick most of the time but really she just wants seymour to get him uh her her tonic, which is really just a, so she's really just an alcoholic who's doing yeah. <laughs> this tonic with like ninety percent alcohol. Is that in the yeah. is that in the musical version? I can't remember. No, no. In the musical version, um, Seymour is an orphan. Uh, his his parents don't play in. And again, I can totally see why they made that decision. His the you know the character of the mother is just there for uh, for comedy, um, and it works in the movie. It's really funny. You know, like you said, um, when he walks in the house, the radio is playing. And, and the, the DJ gives the call letters and then he says, you've been listening to, you know, WKIT or whatever, music for invalids, music for old invalids. And like, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's goofy and silly. And she's all the time, you know, talking about all of these different uh, ailments that she has. But like you said, it's all really just a cover for the fact that she just wants to be drunk all the time. Have you no sympathy for your poor mother? Laughing at her and mocking her realness, and she's got one foot in the grave. Oh, I didn't mean it. Oh, you never mean it. Oh, come on, look at my tongue. A tongue's a tongue, Ma. They all look the same to me. Oh, did you stop at Dr. Mallard's and get the results of my tests? Yeah, he said there's nothing wrong with you. Oh, not Dr. Mallard. He, he's one doctor I thought would tell the truth. He said you should be playing fullback for the Ram. He wants me dead. I'll bet he's assistant coroner. Well, his flower starts to grow a little bit. Um, the thing that he uh, recognizes, uh, 
basically because he's moving another plant on the table to make way for the other flower, which has, I guess, a thorn in it, um, and it cuts him. And the plant opens up a little bit and clearly uh, is moved by the blood. It wants the blood. And yeah. So he's like, you really, you, you need blood. And so he starts to squeeze some of the blood out of his finger into the plant. And then it cuts to what we only know is a few days later because Seymour, now Seymour's fingers, every single one of them are bandaged. <laughs> right. And, and uh, he's been feeding the plant and the plant's been growing um, because he's been feeding it blood. But of course he hasn't been telling anybody. The only thing that's that's been happening is that Mushnik's been getting more business because the plants become a little more notorious. And there are a couple right. of uh, characters. So I was also trying to remember if they were in the musical, the, the character of the two high school girls. Um, they're not in the musical, but oh they're gosh. combined into a different character, just a customer. Um, and, and all of the little stuff that they do, these girls, they come in, they're impressed by this strange and unusual plant. Um, and then Mushnik says something like, you would like maybe to buy something. Well, we don't have any money, except $2,000. But that's just to spend on flowers. So we don't have any of our own. Isn't that a drag? You got your $2,000 just for to spend on flowers? Mm -hmm. That's right. Who died? The Chamber of Commerce? <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, the, you know, they are in charge. There's like a, uh, a rose festival or something that they're in charge of all the de uh, decorations for and... Um, all of that is, you know, combined into different aspects uh, in the play. Um, but again, you know, they, these girls, you know, as it would happen in real life, because this nerdy little guy invented this cool plant, like they're fawning all over him and screaming like he's the Beatles. And um, <laughs> they're, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna buy all the flowers for this Rose Festival there. And uh, again, you know, it's just, it's setting it up so that, you know, um, Audrey Jr. in the musical, they changed it to Audrey, excuse me, Audrey 2. Um, but in the play, they, uh, Seymour has named it Audrey Jr. Um, the plant is going to be responsible for the business thriving. Um, and so there's a lot at stake um, because uh, after the girls kind of fawn over the plants a little bit, Mrs. Shiva comes back in and, you know, explains that somebody else has died. And then she said, um, yes, I need some flowers, but you ought to give some flowers to that dead plant over there too. Um, and they look over and Audrey Jr. has wilted and browned and is now dying. And so um, Seymour figures he's going to have to figure out a way um, to continue to feed it so that business will continue to thrive because everybody's counting on him. Um, and here's one of the things that differed um, uh, differs in in the musical um the first time seymour goes out looking for food and it's not really clear you know what he's anticipating finding yeah um, but he goes to the he goes to the railroad tracks and uh, he sees a bottle sitting on like a ledge um and he picks up a big rock to throw at the bottle and it's such a funny gag like as soon as he throws it this guy pops up from behind the ledge and reaches for the bottle like he's gonna drink it it's booze or whatever and the rock hits him in the head instead of hitting um the bottle and then he gets up and stumbles right in front of the train and is killed um so seymour now has something that he can give to the plant um he didn't act you know there was no malicious intent he didn't murder somebody it was an accident um and that's a little bit different uh than the musical in the movie um and and silly and so contrived you know oh it's, yeah it's, but <laughs> <laughs> but but you don't care, you know, like it's obviously playing it for the fun. It's playing it for the joke. Um, and for that reason, it works. And so he does, you know, he, he feeds you know, body parts to the plant. Um, and the next day the plant has grown even larger, really large. And that was one of the things that I thought was funny, you know, in our production and most productions I've seen, um, there's usually three different sizes of plants. There's a little tiny one, and then there's kind of a medium sized one. And then there's the great big one that can eventually eat whole people and it seemed like in the movie they kind of had the same constraints as far as props go but they kept trying to make it as as seymour continued to feed people to it it's like they kept trying to make it look bigger and bigger but it seemed like the same prop to me <laughs> Did it to you? <laughs> yeah like maybe they just put the camera a little closer to it or something yeah. like that <laughs> right yeah it really did it's not until it's gigantic that uh 
that it looks any different. You know, as soon as it's big enough for people to kind of climb into. <laughs> right. But it always looks fake. I mean, it's the fakest looking oh, yeah. plant prop. It's like paper mache. And, uh... <laughs> oh, yeah, it's really – it's goofy. And that's really the only um, s- semi-gross part of it, is, I think, is when he's got like a foot or a hand and he's squeezing a piece into uh, the plant that it, it's – it's kind of a right, but again, gross. it's really not. No, it's not. Gory. I mean, I guess no, and it's obvious that you know these. <laughs> they're obviously props. You know, they yeah. look like cheap plastic props. Um, and I'm, sh- you know, whether that was budget or time constraint or even a deliberate choice, which I almost feel like it, it may be a very well have been a deliberate choice to not go for realism. You know, what would be the point of going for realism in this goofy thing? Oh yeah. Um, so uh, I, I thought it was. I, I thought it was hilarious. I was, you know, chuckling the whole time. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, you're right. I think that's. And again, we're we're at a time in movie making where people really weren't going for major gore, at least not yet. Definitely not Roger Corman. He wasn't doing that right. until a little later. But it's funny when it cuts from him feeding the plant. There are lots of neat little touches in this movie. It cuts straight from him feeding the plant, I believe, to Mr. Mushnick eating some steak in a restaurant, and he's eating with Audrey, and so. Am I to understand that their relationship is he's her grandfather? I don't know. I never really figured that out. And, and it kind of threw me because, again, this doesn't happen in the musical. Yeah, they're out. It almost seems like they're on a date. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I couldn't figure out what their relationship was. She calls him by his first name. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I guess maybe they're just friends because they work together uh, later on you know as seymour becomes more famous it becomes obvious that audrey is kind of interested in him and seymour eventually asks her out on a date um and mr mushnick doesn't have any problem with that it doesn't seem like you know they're in a relationship or anything so i was i was a little thrown i wasn't exactly sure what the relationship was but in the end it doesn't really matter um it was really just more of uh, a way you know, to kind of have them outside of the shop so that Seymour could be in the shop feeding body parts to the plant. And then Mr. Mushnick, who had forgotten his money at the shop, has to go back and he sees Seymour feeding body parts to the plant. And that's something that's different in this movie, too. Mr. Mushnick doesn't figure it out until quite a bit later. Um, and in the in the musical, um, when Mr. Mushnick finds out, he does have... Um, you know, uh, his conscience bothers him and, and he wants to have Seymour um, uh, turn himself in. And in the musical, to avoid that happening, Seymour allows the plant to eat Mr. Mushnick. And none of that happens here. Instead, Mushnick sees it and he's got, you know, kind of his conscience is bothering him. But because business is going so well, he kind of lets it slide. And Seymour tells him, you know, I crossed these two different types of plants. One of them is a fly trap. And typically with fly traps, they eat like three times in their entire lifetime until they're full grown and then they don't eat anymore. Um, so Mushnick thinks, all right, well, if the plant has already eaten all it needs to, then maybe we can just kind of look the other way and not worry about it. Yeah, he keeps pulling Seymour aside after some of these bigger events or after he can he knows that the plant's gotten bigger, so he must have gotten fed, saying like, uh, so this is the last time, right? So this is it, right? And Seymour's like, yeah, yeah, I just don't see how it can get any bigger. <laughs> right, right. But it, it's great because after that next morning, uh, when, of course, uh, after Mushnick has watched that happen and uh, the – plant shop is booming because they're all looking at everybody's coming in to see the plant i guess mr mushnick hasn't come to work until much later that's what you can do when you're the owner i suppose Uh, (laughs) it's funny how he walks in and he's so stunned he's like stunned at the people and he's stunned at the attention it's getting but then of course his conscience is nagging him and so you get that great uh series of lines where the girls are talking with him mr mushnick we talked to the committee and they said we could use your flower on the float <laughs> which is just so funny it's such a funny image um, and they're so excited and it's just so stupid that they would be so excited about this big ugly plant but it, oh god they are fun it is an ugly plant too it's hard to believe every, anybody's getting excited about this thing <laughs> and, and and you know again like 
you forgive the the choppy writing because you're just in it for the fun. You know, you're not expecting a lot of continuity. You're not expecting amazing storytelling. You know, the the day after he feeds the the railroad guy um, to the plant, um, Seymour comes in and all of a sudden he has a toothache. Uh, so he has to go to the dentist. You know, it's a total non sequitur. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay, I have a toothache now. I have to go to the dentist. Um, and he goes, and this is so funny. You know, in the movie, they write in a motive for him to kind of have negative feelings towards the dentist anyway. That's all absent here. Um, he just goes because he has a toothache. And, you know, there's no explanation for why really this dentist is so sadistic. He just is. And, you know, his customers are screaming and he's just pulling out teeth for fun. And um, Seymour gets in there and, you know, the dentist pulls out one of his teeth. And um, then, you know, in such clunky storytelling, um, <laughs> the dentist like picks up a, a scalpel or something and Seymour grabs the drill, which is like hanging on an arm. And he says, ah, Ah, a duel and they start like sword fighting like little kids would sword fight with like <laughs> butter knives or something and the dentist just like stumbles backwards i guess hits his head on the wall and is dead like yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's so goofy it's, it, it's so really, goofy it, it, it's really dumb. it's almost so goofy it, and it's so dumb and that's why it's funny um, like you're just laughing at how ridiculous it is, and I thought it was cute. Well, they're really going out of their way to find people. Either the people who are going to be fed to the plant have to be people who deserve to die in some way, like the dentists, or it's a total accident uh, that they were killed, and that Seymour is not right. actually going out and killing them. Um, you know, even in the even in the musical, they kind of do that. I mean, he goes to the dentist with the idea. Uh, that he's going to feed him to the plant, so he's going to kill him, but he can't get up the strength to do it. And it turns out the dentist kind of kills himself with the laughing gas. Right, right, so, right, right. Yeah, it, I, it keeps you uh, sympathetic to the Seymour character instead of turning him into this tragic... Uh, uh, well, it keeps him a tragic figure instead of turning him into this, uh, this guy. A monster. You know, yeah, exactly, right. The, the scenes, you know, some of them are completely they have no relevance to the rest of the movie. You know, this is when Jack Nicholson comes in um, and Jack Nicholson um, comes in and for no explained reason, um, he's like a mortician or something and he gets off on pain. So he wants the dentist to like drill him and pull his teeth and whatnot. So because the dentist is dead, Seymour, um, uh, takes his place, like pretends to be the dentist and uh, he pulls out a bunch of Jack Nicholson's teeth. Um, and it all happens so quickly. Like Jack Nicholson is in the movie for probably a total of five minutes, if that. Um, and he's young. Like you said, this is one of his first movies. I think I looked it up. I think he was about 23. Um, I mean, it's, there's no mistaking him, you know, no. he has such a unique look and voice. There's no mistaking him, but, um, he just, and he plays this goofy little role. I, I guess, you know, when he had come in, um, Corman or whomever had told him, that they were really going for, you know, slapstick farce. And, and so he's just playing it really, really silly. Um, that, that did kind of carry over to the film version. Um, not, not the, uh, musical, but the film version of the musical, uh, Bill Murray plays, uh, that character and hysterically. So, oh um, God. but it was, it was, it was cool to see, uh, it was cool to see Jack Nicholson in that little cameo. Now I can't remember how it is in the um, '80s film version and the and the play, but I was watching this with Jack Nicholson. I I just couldn't help but think, man, this would be a much more effective scene if he wasn't playing it up so much at first. Because part of the comedy in this is this tension. Okay, Seymour's got a cover for the fact that the dentist is dead, so he's playing the dentist. But here is a patient coming in who's expecting dental work, and so. You know, it would have been a, a little bit of a better scene if uh, if he didn't if if we didn't know the patient was weird until Seymour was sort of forced into this awkward moment sure. of having to drill, and then we we find out oh it's okay because this guy's weird and he gets off on pain anyway. Um, sure, I don't know. Is that how it is in the movies or or not really? In <laughs> Uh, no, in the movie, Bill Murray plays it just as weird. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, but like, like you said, they were filming this so quickly. Um, I read somewhere that I think in his biography, Jack Nicholson talked about this movie and he talked about how they filmed it so quickly that they never even really finished that scene. Um, they shot the, the sections in the waiting room and then they shot the sections in the, uh, dentist office and, 
happens during the scene, I think that Seymour like kind of climbs up on him or I don't know, but something happened where the actor who was playing Seymour um, uh, knocked over a piece of the equipment, the dental equipment, and it started to fall. And Roger Corman didn't yell cut, nothing. He just stepped into the scene, grabbed the equipment, kept it from falling and said, cut, that's it. We're done. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, he, he, he wasn't even willing to like stop and reshoot it. Um, so they just kind of ended it where it ended. Uh, and so we, we get very little of, of anything in there. Um, and then it cuts back out and Jack Nicholson has his back to the camera. And when he turns around, a bunch of his teeth are blacked out, but he's a happy customer. Well, Dr. Favre, it's been quite an afternoon. I can truly say I've never enjoyed myself so much. I'll recommend you to all my friends. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Um, and that's it. it. It has no implication on the rest of the movie at all. Um, it's just a goofy little comedy bit. That's right. And I think it's immediately after this then that uh, we get to the dragnet style cops, right? Right. And they're in there, and and they are so dragnet. It's obviously, I mean, it was still a popular uh, TV show at this time, even um, obviously much more part of the pop culture than it is today. But even today, you recognize that oh, I am Joe Friday. Hey, I'm you know, and they just right. go back and forth and they talk very seriously and in, in these short clipped sentences. And this was. This was my favorite bit of dialogue in the whole movie. It was so funny because they play it so dry. How's the wife, Frank? Not bad, Joe. Glad to hear it. The kids? Lost one yesterday. Lost one, eh? How'd that happen? Playing with matches. Well, those are bricks. Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. I just thought it was one of the funniest things I'd ever heard. They just play it so dry. So they go and they visit the store. They visit Mushnik. And again, this doesn't make a lot of sense either because I believe what they're investigating is the death of the bum. Isn't that right? And the dentist. And the dentist both, yeah. Oh, okay. Because Seymour, I thought, cleaned up pretty good after the death of the bum. Uh, He put all his body parts in a bag. So how they would have run across or known about the death of the bum when nobody else was around. And and anybody who would have been around would have seen Seymour cleaning it up so they'd have a little more to go on, I think. Well, and – well, in the way, you know, unless I missed something, there was nothing that would have led them to the flower shop. No, you know, absolutely like, nothing. There was no connection. You know, not that they had any kind of lead or whatever. It's almost like they just stumbled in there because there were a lot of other people there. Um, well, was so, the, yeah. the dentist was in Skid Row 2 or whatever, so they're going into all right, the Skid right. Row shops or something. You're right. It, it, it made no sense. Um, I think it was just there to add another element to the film or to provide mm-hmm. some kind of sense that Seymour, they're closing in on him in some way. Uh, but again, they right. had nothing to go on. <laughs> go After ahead. that, I mean, uh, they, they win – you know, Seymour, they come in and the plant is really big the next morning, you know, this happens in a sequence of days or whatever. Um, there's a cute little exchange between Audrey and Seymour where Audrey kisses him and he's like, oh, you don't have to kiss me. And she's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I'm sure you don't like it. And she's like, no, I do like it. And so they kiss again. And he asks her on a <laughs> that date. That scene is so um, <laughs> I know. So it's just so, super clunky and silly. Um, then this lady, this fancy pants lady comes in and she's from the Society of Silent Flower Observers of Southern California. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and she tells uh, Seymour that um, their society has taken notice of this plant and they want to give him a trophy. So they're going to come back when the big blooms, there's big blossoms on the plant. When those blossom, they're going to come back and they're going to give him this uh, trophy. Um, Audrey and Seymour go on a date at Seymour's house, which again is just more goofball stuff. Everything that the mom serves for dinner is just some sort of medicine disguised as food. Uh, and it all sounds disgusting. Um, and meanwhile, while they're there, Mush Nick has said that he's going to stay and babysit the plant because he doesn't want any more murders to happen. Um, One of the things that we haven't mentioned yet that I was actually really surprised by – I did not expect in this movie for the plant to talk. I thought that surely that was something that they put in for the musical. I thought it was just way too goofball, but it does. The plant talks in this movie too. And, you know, it's just, it sounds like this disembodied voice, you know, and it's just all it says is feed me food, more food, hungry. Um, And Seymour hears it and is not confused or frightened. You know, it's like, oh, the plant talks. (laughs) 
Mushnik, it, you know, it talks in front of Mushnik and Mushnik, you know, oh, I guess we have a talking plant here. Like, yeah. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> he just starts responding to it. I'm not going to feed, you're not getting fed tonight. And it's just, <laughs> right. I, I, and, and then, so while, go ahead. I was going to say the voice of the plant, uh, apparently it's uncredited, but it apparently is the voice of the writer. Yeah, I, I guess that the writer actually played several different roles, um, smaller roles. Um, while Mushnik is babysitting the plant, a robber comes in because I guess he's seen how successful the, the business has been over the last few days. And Mushnik hides from him, but the robber sees him. And um, apparently that was the writer as well, um, the robber. Uh, and uh, Mushnik kind of tricks him into thinking that the money is in the plant. And he tells him just to knock on the plant and the plant opens up and then the robber gets eaten. That's actually how Mushnik meets his demise uh, in the play is Seymour tells him that the money's in the plant. And that's how Mushnik gets it. But it's a little different here. Yeah, in this in this movie, Mushnik survives through the whole thing. Yep, and does well. Everybody does. Well, no, that's not fair. Not everybody does. Um, but yeah, the 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 play actually ends um, on a really dark note. Um, every pretty much everybody dies. Uh, Mushnik gets eaten. Um, Audrey uh, gets killed by the plant and and seymour ends up you know because she's died he he feeds her to the plant um and then seymour uh, gets eaten by the plant too um that doesn't happen if you're only familiar with the movie that doesn't happen because they filmed it that way and um test audiences hated it uh so they went back and and refilmed a, a happy ending where the plant was defeated um if you're curious uh if you like the movie and you didn't know that um the the deleted um ending scenes are available on youtube too but i didn't know that you know, for the longest time until I was an adult. Uh, but yeah, it, it ends on a pretty dark note. Oh, and while we're talking about it, if you are, you got to go and see the ending to the, uh, to the 1980s version that's up on YouTube that was deleted. It is a massive production. That original it is. ending. It's really cool. It's hard to believe that they just cut all of that out because there's so much, many special effects and it so goes much, on for like yeah. 20 minutes. It's crazy. So much production. Yeah. Yeah. Where the plant takes over the world. In this case, right. um, it's cute because uh, see, uh, so after the thief is dead, uh, the plant burps up his gun. <laughs> right, and, right. And then we're back to Seymour and Audrey, and, and I think they're having another date, or they're getting excited. Yeah. Uh, they come back. And it's interesting because Seymour says what I think is my, one of my favorite lines in this thing when he's talking about his future. Of course, this is something in the play that they build real up, is that part of the whole thing is just to get out of Skid Row get out of right. this terrible existence they have. And he says, Tomorrow they're going to give me a trophy and I'll be famous. I'll be a big botanist. And then we can go to the South Seas just like we planned and all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, just like all those other notorious, famous, rich botanists out there. <laughs> okay. I love that line. There is a, a sequence in this movie that's neither in the play or in the remake, um, and I thought that it was really kind of strange, and I understand why they left it out. Um, but uh, Seymour, well, the plant talks in front of Audrey, but Seymour plays it off that he's like doing ventriloquism or something stupid like that. And Audrey takes off, and Seymour comes back in and says, I'm not feeding you anymore. And the plant says, close your eyes. And so Seymour closes his eyes, and the plant goes, you're asleep. And then he goes, open your eyes. And all of a sudden, Seymour is hypnotized by yeah. the plant. And, and is, is saying things like, must get food for master. And he's walking around like a zombie outside. And there's this whole sequence where this hooker is trying to get his attention. And it's just so funny like over like he just keeps walking by her and then he'll be walking along and she'll appear somewhere else and she keeps trying to get his attention um and eventually she does and he thinks that she's trying to volunteer herself as food when really she's trying to volunteer herself for something very different um <laughs> But she says, he says something like, my place or yours. And uh, she says, I don't care. And he says, well, we'll flip for it. But he says, I don't have a coin. She says, we'll flip something else. And so he picks up a rock off the ground and like spits on one side of it. Wet or dry? Wet. <laughs> I, thought it was kind of, I thought it was kind of a risque joke for the 1960s. Um, 
And so he tosses the rock up in the air and it comes down, of course, and lands right on her head. And so then she's dead and he feeds her to the plant too. And that leads up to the scene. It's, it's the morning where the people, um, the society of the silent flower observers have come uh, to give the trophy. Yeah. And for some reason, they've decided that it's impossible for them to give him the trophy until, until the plant blooms. <laughs> right. So they've all got to be there to witness the plant bloom, which apparently happens on a very precise time scale because they're all there and the buds open and you see the faces of the dead people on the plant. And the cops mm-hmm. are there too, for some reason. And so they uh, see this and I guess sort of put two and two together. Hey, these are the victims. We at least need to uh, to catch the Krellborn kid. And so Seymour mm-hmm. takes off running and there's this extended, excruciating, dumb chase sequence <laughs> Through Skid Row, through all of the the weird parts of the city. Suddenly, it's nighttime, I guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like, thought that part was really funny because I have no idea where they ran and I have no idea where they shot it. But at one point, they're running through this huge like tire yard. And it's like all these enormous tires and they're like running over the top of them and through them and stuff. When they don't um, need and to. And it, it made no sense. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea where it was, but it was kind of a cool vision. Um, and then they ended up like I guess maybe it was a junkyard or something they ended up in this place where there were a bunch of toilets and uh, it was like you said it was kind of excruciatingly long Um, I don't know if they were stretching for time it's a short movie it's under uh, an hour 20 Um, but yeah and it's pointless because Seymour you know they chase him around and then he just ends up coming back to the shop anyway well I remembered you know and I don't know if it's just the thought everything mixing together in my head but I distinctly remembered a different ending to this movie. I know it doesn't have a different ending, but it's just interesting how your mind um, remembers things as a kid. I remembered a better ending to this movie. <laughs> I remember yeah. that um, – because at, after the big chase scene, uh, Seymour's back at the shop with the plant, and he basically says, I'm going to take care of you once and for all. And he grabs a knife, and he climbs into the plant with the knife. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the idea yep. is, I guess he thinks he's going to kill the plant from the, you know, the inside. I mean, forget about hacking right. it away at it from the outside where it's safer. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, my recollection of the ending was that the society for the flower givers had not had not seen none of that budding had happened yet. But he had gone into the plant to kill it. And then the next morning, everybody had gathered to see the plant open up. And that's when they saw the buds of the different people uh, who had been killed. And then the last bud that opened was Seymour, had Seymour's face on it. Um, and then saying, I'm really sorry, everybody. And then drooping down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and arguably, arguably, I think that would have been a better ending. Um, it, it's almost like they needed a way to get that chase scene in there. <laughs> yeah, and so they had, so they had to see it before. Um, but yeah, then of course, Mushnik and Audrey and Seymour's mom, um, and maybe a few, maybe the cops. I don't know who else are in there. And uh, yeah, the the bud opens, and it's Seymour's face. So he's, I didn't mean it. <laughs> and the plant wilts. Now, I, I read after um, after having watched the movie, I, I just you know I looked up everything I could on Wikipedia in the plot synopsis. It says that I guess that the intention was supposed to be that the plant dies, like having eaten Seymour, it dies. I didn't get that from it, um, but uh, but that's that's it. That's where it ends. They all kind of stand there in shock, and then the end flashes up on screen, and that's it. Movie's over. Yeah, it's um it's kind of abrupt, but it's also silly and very contrived how it gets there. So you're kind of ready for the movie to be over at this point, I think. There's not w- yeah, yeah. much else there's nowhere else it's really going to go. Um but at least they you know, kept it a little tragic. I guess it made sense that Seymour died. It it didn't make a lot of sense in real life that Seymour wouldn't have just no. killed the plant, cut it from its stem, right. or you know, there are any number of ways besides climbing into it that you could have killed the plant. But Right. Now, in the play, they kind of try to rectify that a little bit. You know, he he tries to shoot the plant. Nothing happens. He tries to poison it. Nothing happens. And so he says, you may be tough on the outside, but I'll hack you apart from the inside. Um, So they and I have to you know, I I still love that movie, the musical movie. And I think that the writing there is really clever and they really cleaned up some of the sloppier things um, from the original. Um, But, yeah, I mean, it's I, I don't hold it against this version 
because it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, and that's the thing, you know, going going into this movie, you have to be ready for goofball silliness. You know, it, it's not taking itself seriously. It's just for fun. If you're looking for, you know, really well crafted storytelling, if you're looking for, you know, something sophisticated, you are going to be way disappointed. But if you just want something cheesy, you know, from this era of, you know, B monster movies, um, I think it's cute. I thought it was a cute little movie. Oh, I'm with you. And, you know, aside from the things that we have definitely outlined where it's, it's, it's contrived and it's cornball and it's silly, I think it actually holds up pretty well in that mm-hmm. as, aside from some outdated references and some silliness, I mean, the jokes are good. They're funny. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, they come at you rapid fast. The movie really moves quickly. Um, and, it, again, it, it is a short film, so you're not sitting through it for very long either. Um, it, it, except for that chase scene, it really doesn't seem to unnecessarily stretch things out too far. Right. It's just a tight, economical, funny little film. And I'm so glad that it's gotten a life beyond this, this older version of the 1960s because I think it kind of deserves it. A credit to the writer, yeah. um, I think, and the ensemble yeah. cast. Yeah, and it's the kind of thing, would I watch it again for my own benefit? Probably not, but might I watch it again to introduce somebody else to it? Maybe, I think so, especially if it was somebody who is a fan of the play or the you know the, mov- the musical movie um, and, and they hadn't uh, experienced it before. I would definitely sit down and watch it with them to kind of see what their reaction was because I, I think it's, it's fun. Well, you know, and poor Roger Corman. I mean, it has gone into such a life of its own after this. Him letting it slip into the public domain. Who would have thought? I hope that at least they're giving him some kind of royalties or something anyway. You know? Yeah. I don't <laughs> you know? know. But, uh, oh, the man's got money. It's not that big of a problem. Sure, sure. <laughs> I, you know, you picked this kind of, you know, as a courtesy to me, and I appreciated that. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm glad we did it. It's not, I don't watch these really old movies very often. Um, and I think that I tell myself that I, wouldn't be interested, you know, that they wouldn't hold my attention, that they're too out of date. Um, and so uh, I'm glad that you suggested it and that we watched it because it really is kind of a, a look back at a time that um, is, is long gone, long gone. You just don't see these kind of movies anymore. And it was, it was a fun, it was a fun way to spend an hour and 20 minutes of my afternoon today. You know, it's so funny to hear you say that, Craig, knowing that you're a teacher of literature. Like, uh-huh. you know how many people approach, like, Moby Dick? and Well, Moby Dick's a bad example. <laughs> but, <laughs> like, no, a lot of Yeah, classic- I was going to say, you know, I, <laughs> right, I don't look at that stuff. However, the rest of my afternoon today was spent reading A Tale of Two Cities to prep for school coming up. So I, it's not that I don't appreciate uh, antiquity. It's just uh, maybe no. this isn't something I've given enough of a chance. Well, that's what I'm saying is like, uh, you know, you come to these old classic books and you think, oh, it's going to be boring. I'm not going to like it. It's so out of date and blah, blah, blah. And then you read them and you realize there's a reason they're classics, right? Uh, that's exactly right. <laughs> so maybe we'll get exactly you right. that. Maybe you're discovering that all over again with these movies. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of uh, Two Guys in a Chainsaw. Uh, if you liked what you heard today, please share this podcast with a friend. We're on iTunes. We're on Stitcher. And we also have a Facebook page and a Google Plus account that seems to be sometimes more active than our Facebook page. So if you're you're active in any of those arenas, please um, jump on there. Let us know what you thought of this article. And uh, let us know what you want to see coming up in the future. We'd love to hear your suggestions and watch those films. Until then, I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. With Two Guys in a Chainsaw.